Hello, and welcome to Linux Action News, episode 137, recorded on December 20th, 2019. I'm Chris. And I'm Joe. Hello, Joe. Good to be connected with you, and great to start out with some news from Firefox and an update to their DNS over HTTPS support. Yeah, they've added another partner called NextDNS, so now you don't have to use Cloudflare if you want to use DNS over HTTPS. Have you ever heard of NextDNS before this? No, I was hoping you may have done. (laughs) (laughs) I did a little digging. So they launched in March of 2019, so this year as we record. But they're sort of one of these newer, up-and-coming, fancier, a lot more features kind of DNS provider. And DNS over HTTPS, or DOE, as Joe likes to call it, uh, has been one of their major focuses for pushing out different apps to Android, iOS. Um, I think these old legacy desktops called Linux and Windows and Mac OS, not familiar with those, of course, because it's only about mobile, right? Uh, but Cloudflare is like the name, you know. I know Cloudflare, and I have to be honest, that that consumer brand trust thing inside me When I see these two next to each other, sort of trust the Cloudflare name a little more. But looking at NextDNS, they seem like a pretty pretty cool company. And of course, they agreed to Mozilla's privacy requirements. Which are pretty stringent. So that's kind of a good sign, I think. I see what you're saying about Cloudflare being the name you know. And this NextDNS company, we don't really know anything about them. But I don't think it's particularly important who they are. I think what's far more important is that there now is a choice. And this will hopefully open the gates for even more choice. Well put. And I, you know, I like to remind people when we do talk about this, there are self-hosted open source DNS over HTTPS DNS servers you can run now and you could manually enter it in there. But it's nice to see it baked in. We've seen pretty quick adoption of Doe this year. It feels like only a few months ago we started talking about it, and now you can already use it in Firefox and Chrome. I know. I was thinking that too. And Mozilla has sort of positioned itself as an advocate for the technology, which has been fascinating. But it also speaks to how fast Firefox is moving, how fast these features are getting out to end users. It's been a pretty good year for Firefox generally and Mozilla. There have been a few hiccups, but I think I'm pretty positive about them going into 2020. Well said. I think it's been really nice to see. It's been a one of the highlights of 2019, really, which uh, we'll get more into in a future episode. But let's talk about something a little more near term. Apple, Google, and Amazon are joining forces. Yes, cats and dogs are joining forces to rally behind a new smart home standard called CHIP. Now, this is somewhat open source, but I've seen quite a lot of skepticism about this. This is really your area. So I'm very keen to hear what you think about this. Yeah, there are some interesting things we'll get into here, but admit it, Joe, the first thing you thought of was that XKCD comic of uh, all we need is another standard. Yeah, by trying to unify standards, you end up just creating yet another one. And that does feel like what we're going to end up with here. But maybe that new standard will actually be better than the other ones. It sounds really promising, but those companies all working together... On a new standard, even though Apple just open sourced bits of HomeKit and the Z-Wave folks raised their hands and said, uh, um, we, we could do some open sourcing too, but Chip offers something unique. Well, it's all IP based and using IPv6, so maybe that means that it might solve some of your double net issues. Not only that, but it takes advantage of any existing network infrastructure you have. In, so in the case of a, of a Z-Wave home automation network, the Z-Wave radios sort of form a mesh network. And you can have some Z-Wave devices that are boosters and repeaters of the network. But if a device can't talk to the other devices, you have a dead spot in your network. In this case, you could extend a Wi-Fi network, you could drop an Ethernet, and get IP to a device, and it can participate in the overall smart network. But additionally, CHIP allows for fallback to different physical mediums. It can use Bluetooth LE. It has support for cellular. It even understands DSL and DSL authentication for types of ISPs that require that. The thing that CHIP allows for is leveraging off-the-shelf network infrastructure. And that means the cost in manufacturing goes way down and the availability to consumers goes way up. Overall, very skeptical about this, but I like the ideas behind it. 
and the fact that it got Apple to open source bits of HomeKit and the Z-Wave folks to open source their implementation, it seems like a real big net win for the Home Assistant community and other automation communities. Presumably the reason that Apple and Google and Amazon are interested in this is because they want to drive more adoption of their various voice assistants. But my question is, is this going to mean more self-hosting and more being able to hack stuff and not have to rely on the cloud and be able to keep it all within your network or maybe going out to servers that you are in control of elsewhere? I think it's hard to say overall because it will likely come down to each device's implementation if that vendor locks it into a cloud service or something like that. However, open sourcing of Z-Wave, bits of HomeKit, and this new chip standard that they say will also be open source and posted on GitHub surely means great things for communities that are trying to accomplish those types of things, like the Home Assistant community. I'm actually a pretty big fan of HomeKit. It's so silly. I, I hate it because it's, until maybe just now, been sort of a thing of just the Apple iOS ecosystem. And if you don't have iOS devices, it's silly to buy a HomeKit smart plug and a HomeKit light and a HomeKit LED strip. Why would you, why would you spend money on that? You don't have an iOS device. But the HomeKit protocol itself and the little mechanisms and devices around it are really great. It supports IP and Wi-Fi. It supports Bluetooth LE, which means you can incorporate battery-powered sensors and motion sensors and all kinds of little devices throughout your home, as well as bigger devices. And it's all over the LAN. No cloud service required. You could unplug from the internet and still operate all your smart devices. And it's really easy and user-friendly like a lot of Apple stuff is. And like a lot of Apple stuff, it's locked to their ecosystem until maybe now. And Home Assistant has really nailed their HomeKit implementation already, so this could take it to the next level. As far as where I'm sitting, I think this is going to make my setup way, way better, even if this chip stuff doesn't go anywhere. And just the improvements with HomeKit being better documented and Z-Wave going open source would be a huge win and are going to be great for 2020 development. Well, having briefly spoken to Alex about it, he seems pretty skeptical as well. So we'll have to see if we hear more about this on self-hosted in 2020. Yeah, and I'll conclude with this. Smart home automation is so much more than these smart tubes and the ecosystems that Google and Amazon and Apple make available. That's what this is really about. This is about fulfilling the promise of complete low-power device smart home automation that Z-Wave and Zigbee help accomplish now. There are entire automation ecosystems that are way outside the smart speaker ecosystems that are featureful and have been around for years. And so if, if your idea of smart home automation is one of these smart tubes, I think it's worth looking at some YouTube videos or listening to self-hosted to see what else is out there. Because if you're into everything on your LAN, nothing goes out to the cloud, it's all under your control, we have some really Great coverage in the self-hosted program, selfhosted.show. Yeah, even I'm tempted. I might have to give it a go next year at some point. Something I've been intending to play with and is even more appealing now is Multipass. And Canonical has reached 1.0 of the mini cloud on your workstation. Yeah, this 1.0 is coming just a week after the 0.9, which is a bit strange. But what's interesting about it is that it manages your virtual machines using the native hypervisor on whatever platform you're using. So KVM on Linux, Hyper-V on Windows, and HyperKit on macOS. So this is just going to work no matter what development environment you want to use. The virtualizer is just a detail now that you don't even need to concern yourself with. Multipass will handle it for you. And this is really kind of a canonical slash Ubuntu focused approach of being able to just quickly fire up a VM and get to work. You want to test something or try something or have an idea. Why even putz around with the KVM setups? Why mess with your virtual boxes or your hyper V's when you could just use multipass? I really like the idea. And if I was building a lot of Ubuntu VMs on a regular basis and integrating updates and things like this, this would probably be a go-to tool. Or imagine doing development testing with this. You can fire up a quick multi-pass environment. And if you're a developer, maybe you don't know how to get the KVMs on your old Linux box. This will take care of it for you. It feels like bumping this to a 1.0 release is just another little duck getting into a row for Canonical. 
they've done a lot this year to get everything onto that professional level and now they can say that it's a, a 1.0 stable for multipass it feels like a small part of a much bigger picture to me yeah perhaps i think too when you look at the mac os support that's interesting to me it looks like telling a story of full platform developer support whatever platform they're on we've got a quick way for them to create vms oh you're on windows why don't you also try out ubuntu on the Windows subsystem for Linux as well. <laughs> they've, really, they've really nailed that. We have something that's approachable by developers for just about any platform they want, even if it's Mac, even if it's Windows. I remember at the beginning of this decade, Shuttleworth talking about wanting to get Ubuntu everywhere on TVs and fridges and stuff like that. And the reality is that Ubuntu kind of is everywhere now, but not necessarily for the consumer, at least not in their face, but it's everywhere for developers and everywhere in the cloud. Whoa, you just blew my mind, Joe. And you're right. And what's kind of cooler about this way it turned out is it's not necessarily exclusive to Ubuntu. Like a TV deal with a, say say LG had chosen Ubuntu instead of WebOS for their smart televisions. That's not something Fedora could approach necessarily. That's locked in. They got it. They got it. probably a multi-year agreement, special R&D relationship, et cetera, et cetera. But this kind of stuff is they built it and they got there. They they took the Windows subsystem seriously. They built tools for developers. They've targeted the cloud platforms very aggressively. They've tried to make it easy to get going and start writing applications on their platform wherever you're at. And um, they didn't have to do it with any kind of crazy contracts or lock-in or anything that's dirty play or a special advantage. They just did it based on the quality of the product and the demand from developers. So I, you got to respect it. They, and you're right, they are kind of lining everything up. They're getting a real complete picture here now. There's been a bit going on with KDE over the last week and some good news for Krita. Some very good news from the folks at Epic. You know, the makers of the Unreal game engine, they have given Krita a $25,000, what they call mega grant. And this follows recent money that went to Blender and then uh, Lutris before this. Yeah, but the amount that they gave to Blender was $1.2 million as opposed to 25000 to Krita. So it's kind of a different scale. Yeah, although if I'm looking at it from Epic standpoint, Blender is likely a more vital tool in the model creation for games, right? Whereas Krita could be more of its art, its touch-up, its cover art, but it's not necessarily core to game creation. Where Blender, you could create worlds in that thing. <laughs> And it is definitely going to help. And it's also good promotion for Krita. It's good publicity. I mean, we're talking about it. Yeah. Well, I think one of the things I find fascinating is it's one of those awkward feels that we have found ourselves in over and over again in 2019. And that is commercial company that has crazy app store or does crazy practices and has really, really commercial practices or whatever it could be. You know, there's there's several examples of these. Microsoft. <clears throat> Anyways. And then they do something really great, and you're like, oh. And then they do something really great again, and then again. And you go, oh, man, now I like, I kind of like challenge my assumptions about a lot of things. This is really weird. And that's why I find these stories fascinating. What about this Kubuntu-powered laptop then? Yeah, what about this thing? How about this? A laptop that will sell preloaded with Kubuntu on it. And in the Phronix article that we'll link to that Michael Arbel wrote up, he says... They're going to get, quote, a significant contribution from each laptop sold to the Kubuntu Council. It looks like it's a Clevo P960RD with some alterations to improve the Linux experience. It's got a NVIDIA RTX card in there and an Intel i7-9750H. Yeah, and 32 gigabytes of RAM, and you are going to pay for all of that. Yeah, what do you suppose the prices is? I went and priced the stock Clevo model, and it started around $1,500. Well, we don't know for sure yet, but from a post in the Pharonix forums by Michael Mikowski, who says he's the director of this project, he says that it's going to be $2,400, which is pretty pricey. But then for that spec, it's only a markup of about $300, he reckons. And they have done a lot of work to optimize it and make everything work. I could really see why distributions would want to 
monetize a little bit by selling a hardware experience where they can put a little extra effort into it. I don't know how much involvement the Kubuntu project had here, but I like to fantasize about elementary OS pre-shipping on an XPS 13 type of piece of hardware and how nice that experience would be and how if they were to work on it a little bit, they could really nail it. But you got to wonder how these programs are going to work. I believe this particular Kubuntu Focus laptop is backed by Tuxedo. So in theory, Tuxedo would be doing the support. But I'd like to know how that's going to work because I could see this happening for more and more distributions as time goes on. And if I'm going to spend $2,400 on a one-off laptop like this, especially when it's the first one they've ever done, I'm really curious what that support story looks like two years down the road when I need to replace the keyboard or something. Well, I've heard very mixed things about Tuxedo computers. Some people say that they're good. I know that they shipped a review unit to the Ubuntu podcast, and those guys were not impressed at all with that. But that was a while ago. So hopefully they've improved things since then. I'm not sure how much of a market there's going to be for this, because at that kind of price, there's a lot of competition. And yes, it's going to support Kubuntu and a Linux-first vendor, but are people really going to go for it? I don't know. Yeah, we'll see. I think one of my favorite things about Linux is that I can load it on all of my computers, whereas Mac OS seems so limited because it can only be installed on Macs. That seems crazy that my primary operating system could only be installed on certain hardware. So I don't know if I really like this this line anyways, this idea. But I, you know, for new users, I could see it appealing. The fact of the matter is, is Plasma is great. And I'd love to see more computers shipping with Plasma as default. Well, Plasma is hopefully going to get even better thanks to a competition that KDE have launched to make promotional videos and wallpapers for them. And the prizes are a couple of tuxedo computers. This is a fun approach they're taking. I've been involved with some of these promotional videos. I've done two or three of them for the project when they had new releases. But I think it's always kind of a cram because somebody in the project has to animate the video, then they got to get me a script, and I record it and send it back to them, and then they got to and you know time the music and all of that. So this idea here is maybe there's people out there in the community that just love doing video and could put together a great promotional video to talk about the 5.18 release, which sounds like it's really shaping up to be a very good release. So they'd love to really promote it, and why not have a few people submit and see... Which one's the best? I like that idea a lot. The wallpapers one, that's always fun. Eh, you know, whatever. But that video thing, I think that's a good idea. I think when new releases come out that have a bunch of really hard work put into them, doing something in video helps people understand the improvements from one release to the other. When you're going from 5.17 to 5.18, but you've made dramatic improvements and changed a lot of defaults, it's nice to illustrate that when a version number just doesn't. What do you think about the rule that you've got to use free software to make the video? Well, I would use KDN Live. So, I mean, that's not so bad. Yeah. (laughs) I'm not big on telling people what tools to use uh, to express themselves. I'm more of a whatever tool works for you. These ones happen to be the best for me, and I'd love to tell you about them kind of guy. Not you must use my tool kind of guy. But, um, you know, I guess if you're, it's it's for an open source project, right? And, what better way to test these things out, work out the kinks, than to dog food them like this? So in this instance, I think it, I think it kind of works. What do you think? Yeah, I can kind of understand why. They want to have the assets and the source files, presumably so that they can tweak them a little bit if necessary. So that's one justification for it. Although it, it does feel a little bit elitist, maybe. Maybe you've got great skills on a Mac with Final Cut or whatever, and you could create this great promotional video for them. It it just seems a little bit um, like they're excluding potential creators. But I do understand the thinking behind it, especially if they want the assets. Yeah, and if if they could somehow package all those assets up and then somebody else could work on them next time for the next release, then it sort of even continues to increase in value and sort of solidify why they would make that decision. It's their call at the end of the day, and it's... It's their contest, but I think you and I sort of see it more eye-to-eye on that one. I'm not so sure we're so eye-to-eye on the Atari VCS. Maybe I'm just a uh, hopeful diehard. Yeah, we've seen a blog post from Atari this week on Medium. (laughs) Am I wrong about Medium? You open it and it's just suddenly full screen pop-up and you can't see anything. Hey, Joe. Hey, Joe. Can I tell you about the newsletter? (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> God, I hate that. Uh, I'm so glad that Elementary moved off Medium. But anyway, so this blog post is pretty much saying, hey, let's create some content, everyone, for the VCS. It's coming soon. And be sure to use Unity Engine and all the standard tools, please. Well, you can use um, some of the built-in stuff that comes with uh, Debian as well, but they are kind of putting Unity first here. Creators can start developing games and apps for the Atari VCS right now, they write, with the Unity tools. Now, that's all good. That's fine. You know, when I backed this project, besides just feeling slightly nostalgic and they got me there, but much like why I backed Stadia, I'm not even a big gamer, but I really believe in encouraging development of games on Linux and encouraging the ecosystem to keep Linux a viable gaming platform, to keep Vulkan working great, to stay on top of the underlying sound systems and the graphic systems, and to keep pressure on our display servers to stay competitive. Gaming has a lot of ancillary benefits, even when you're primarily using it as a workstation like I do, who sometimes I like to game, you know, but as a guy who's using his computer in the most part, I'm not gaming. But I back these things because I do see it has a bigger picture impact. When I see that they're just targeting Unity, <laughs> it's nice to see. I mean, it still means like Mesa and the other stuff underlying has to be working and the Vulcan drivers and all that. But it's it's not quite like it is with Stadia, where the game has to be essentially ported to Linux to work on the platform. This, not quite what I was hoping my money would be used for, but I, I knew that was part of the risk. Yes, but what we're going to end up with here, or what you're going to end up with, because you've bought it, is essentially just a Linux PC in a nice Atari-looking case. And anything that is going to work on it, any content, games and apps and anything like that, are going to have to work on Debian, because that's what the operating system is running on. And the more they kind of pull back on their promises of developing all of this custom software, and the more they rely on standard distributions and standard sets of software, the more of a generic Linux box it's going to be, which makes it less exciting, but it means that if they can leverage that Atari brand to get developers onto the platform, then they're just getting them onto a standard Linux platform. And okay, if they're using Unity, fair enough, at least those games are going to work on Linux and porting them to other distributions is presumably and hopefully going to be fairly straightforward. I thought they were using Ubuntu, uh, but it seems to have switched to Debian a fair bit ago. Uh, absolutely. That's my optimistic take on it, which is why I'm surprised to hear you see it that way. But that's what I'm hoping. Although there is sort of um, a detail in this whole post that I think belays where things are actually going to get a little gray. So they write about this whole thing, like, just target Unity, just target Linux, and you're good to go. You can expect a large majority of Linux-compatible content to be fully compatible with the Atari VCS. Quote, sounds like if you write it for Unity and for Linux, it's going to work on the VCS, except for that one detail that they haven't gone into yet. Stay tuned for more information, they say, including a link for registration for our developer certification program. Developers will need to upload their programs to the Atari VCS submission portal for approval. If they blow this aspect and the fact that they don't have their crap together already with clear rules on what's going to work, what's not going to work, where the boundaries are, and what it takes to get approved, the fact that they don't have that already is a big red flag. They can't come out here and tell you to start porting for their platform but not tell you what the rules of the field are. That's ridiculous, and it's a bad sign. And... God only knows what those requirements are going to be. So why would anyone start working on an application or a game for this platform without knowing what those requirements are? That is a very good point. But the way I read it was that it's more of a formality, really. It's just to keep out those really dreadful games where you just do all sorts of terrible things and, you know, real not safe for work stuff. And just to make sure that there is at least some barrier of entry, some collation happening here. That has been essentially the implication, but now's the time where you got to put it down into writing. Make it clear, because now you're asking for developers to spend their time porting their application to Linux or whatever it might take. You know, Even if that's just for some people checking a box in Unity and then testing it, they still need to know. It's still worth their time. Plus, 
They have to understand what the upside is for them. Now, they're making a pretty sweet royalty deal here. Developers will receive 88% royalty on all Atari VCS exclusive titles or 80% royalty on non-exclusive titles. That's still very generous, 80% royalty on non-exclusive titles. That's, of course, just for ones that are approved and then placed in the VCS store. So they could they could get this, you know, a nice-looking box, goes in the living room, has a, a good Linux OS underneath it, so there's always future potential, and a good GUI with Atari branding and an Atari store that makes it easy to get this stuff at a reasonable price with reasonable store rules. It could work. For folks like myself and older, I could see the appeal. It's just going to come down to those rules now, and they got to get them out there as fast as possible, so that way everybody understands what the rules of the field are. Well, we're not doing our predictions for a couple of episodes, but let's do a quick bonus one here. Prediction, do you think that you will receive your VCS in 2020? I do. I do think I will, yes. All right, I'm going to say that you won't then. Really? (laughs) I say because they've made this thing just a standard PC now, it really comes down to the UI on top of Linux and getting the case all dialed in. And then the rest is all on the services side, app store, developers, relationships. But the hardware could ship. It might not ship with a lot of games, but I think the hardware is pretty close. Yeah, let's hope you can install a proper Linux distro on it then, eh? I mean, Debian would be pretty great, but I'd love to, I mean, if nothing else, just use it as a Linux box for a little while and then have it as a keepsake. I have a couple of classic computers that to me are are iconic, and that would be one of them. What a crazy idea. I, I just feel like it's, if nothing else, I'll just appreciate it as a museum piece one day. <laughs> but if I ever do get it, I'll let you know. And, uh, of course, if anything else develops in the world, we'll be covering it. Go to linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe for all the ways to get new episodes. And linuxactionnews.com slash contact for ways to get in touch with us. Next week, we'll be back with our holiday special year in review episode. I am at Chris LAS. I'm at Charles Ressington. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week. See you later.